Hi everyone, I'm Martin and welcome to another great edition for Astronomy for Beginners. Now, this is a particular a busy moment this month. Christmas is coming up and a lot of people will be going out buying some presents for their kids or their loved ones. And one thing I'm doing this video guide is to basically show you on purchasing a telescope. Now, I've seen it many, many times and it disheartens me where I see uh, the parents were going around shopping for, for Christmas presents for the kids. And they're going around a lot of these high street stalls around uh, the shops, shopping malls and they see a nice fancy box saying telescope here, loads of accessories. 300, 400, 500 times magnification, uh, and you see all these fancy pictures in the boxes with the you know, NASA style pictures. And a lot of parents believe that what they are looking at is wow, let's get this for our Christmas for our, uh, our kids. And I, I turn around and cringe, I, I'm sickening uh, that, that there are companies out there that are producing these trash telescopes. Now the reason why I call them trash telescopes is because the, the, the optics are so bad, they have wobbly mounts and the accessories that contain with these trash telescopes are so hideous that you're never going to see anything out of them. So, these parents here will be paying for uh, a telescope for Christmas, expecting to see, wow, it's going to look amazing, uh, our kids are going to love it. And I've seen it all before, and uh, I'm, I've had got experience with this. You know, I had a cheap telescope bought for me for Christmas when I was young, and I was disappointed. I was severely disappointed that I was almost at the point of actually not taking up astronomy. So, again, uh, think closely when you're buying a telescope, particularly for Christmas. If you generally believe your kids are taking astronomy seriously, then buy them good quality equipment. Now, I I'm aware, I am fully aware that most of us have a limited budget. And, again, I strongly agree that telescopes you can buy are expensive. Astronomy equipment is not cheap and it can mount up. Whatever you buy the mount, you buy a telescope, you buy a camera, when you go further afield, it all mounts up. And a lot of us don't like to spend a, a fortune on telescopes. And again, I, I, I I've come across this and I've had a telescope, cheap telescope, it was so appalling that again I never saw anything out of it until one day they uh, decided, uh, my parents, to buy me a pair of binoculars for my birthday and believe it or not, this is the best telescope you can buy for your money. If you're on a limited budget, this perhaps to be the best buy. And the good thing is if the kids or the loved one doesn't want to take astronomy at all and, and lose interest altogether, you are still not wasting your money. Because any day binoculars can be used for other things. Now I saw better views for a pair of binoculars through a cheap telescope. These binoculars produced better results. I can see them on craters I can see the Great Orion Nebula and the Andromeda Galaxy with these pair of binoculars. I can see even the Moon. Uh, I can even see even Jupiter and Saturn. You know, not glorious sights because of the limited magnification. Jupiter's moons through there. You see the phases of Venus. You see a lot of things with this uh, pair of binoculars. And combine that with a star atlas or star map, you can learn the night sky I identify constellations and find all these fascinating objects. 
Now, the reasons why I said the binoculars are better, because you're not wasting your money, and if the, obviously the loved one or whatever falls doesn't want to be interested anymore, you've still got a pair of binoculars that you can use any time at any place. Now, again, if you're one of the parents who have very demanding kids, I can see uh, from the expression for your faces, if you have kids that are very demanding, they want a telescope. And they don't want pair of binoculars. They want a telescope because they look cool, they look awesome. And I can see the fascination because, end of the day, kids love telescopes. They want to see awesome views out of it. And the telescope offers higher amplification, also a light gathering. So you see in more detail, but again, they want a telescope. They think they're awesome. They're cool. I don't know what it's about them. Every time I have a telescope set up or something, uh, I have kids coming up to me and say, "Oh wow, I could have a look through this telescope. It looks awesome." And you think, "Yeah, go on, crack on, have a look, have a look. What you see?" And when they see it first time, they say, "Wow, that's awesome. What kind of telescope? Look, I can buy this. Can I buy this?" And again, I can see the excitement, uh, you know, the, the, the enthusiasm grows, you know, they are so excited what they see. Now, the reason why I'm doing this video guide is that I'm going to do a presentation. Now, I was going to do an example to show you what is a bad telescope. Now, not all cheap telescopes are bad. I'm not here to scare people away from shopping for a telescope for Christmas. I'm just basically going to give you a detailed presentation guide so that you can identify what is a bad telescope and what is a good telescope. Unfortunately, I don't have a bad telescope to show you. Personally, from my experience, I don't want to buy a bad telescope because that defeats the purpose of this presentation. Why should I buy a bad telescope that's so bad I'm going to waste my money? I don't want to. The telescopes I have here are all good telescopes. They're excellent optics, good mounts that are sturdy and rigid, with good optical quality uh, lenses and mirrors, and decent eyepieces and accessories. But then, when you're looking for a telescope like this, like the ST102, expect to pay around about 160 to 180 pounds for a setup like this. We have basic altazimuth mount with slow motion controls, you know, and but it is a four inch scope, which is quite a big aperture for a refractor. Again, you can get smaller apertures. For £160-£180 for this sort of setup, it's ideal, it's perfect. There are cheaper telescopes out there for a lot less money. So there is a boundary on what you can afford and what sort of scopes you can get. So I'm going to go through, show you the presentation on what to look for, uh, what to avoid, and then I'm also going to highlight the latest scams that's out there. What these scams are basically trying to trick customers thinking they're buying a good telescope. Because at the moment, there is a few certain guidelines. And over the past years, I've seen a lot of videos, which are good videos out there on, on YouTube and all that. There's a lot of good uh, advice out there on buying and selecting a telescope. But unfortunately now, uh, these companies that are producing these trash telescopes have now caught on to this and now they are doing new tactics to get customers to buy rubbish. Okay, they don't care about the customers. You know, some of these uh, brands they don't care because they think what they're buying is good. All they're interested in is your money. End of the day, and end of the day, if you pay for something cheap, you will get something cheap. So cheap and nasty. It, will just, it might as well go into the bin. They're that useless. So again, the purpose of this presentation is to prevent you guys and girls from wasting your money. 
Unfortunately, I don't have a bad telescope to show you. There are many reasons behind why I can't show you a bad telescope. But what I will highlight is highlight what a good telescope will be and what to look for in a good telescope. And again, I'll show you some of the tactics that these companies are doing to try and trick the customers. So what you see here are good telescopes. And there are smaller ones than these because obviously I have, you know, I have bigger apertures on these. But there are smaller ones and we are within budget. But my top recommendation to anyone is if you want to buy a telescope for Christmas, please, please visit a dedicated astronomy telescope shop or uh, a camera shop that know uh, that sell telescopes as well, because there are good camera shops out there that shall sell uh, decent telescopes. Uh, these are good telescopes and you'll get decent views, uh, decent optics, decent mounts so they don't wob wobble and decent accessories that will give you a good start into astronomy. Because believe me, a lot of the cheap telescopes out there will put people off from astronomy and they'll find it, well this is rubbish. I don't want to do this, this is boring, it's rubbish, the telescope's useless, I'm going to throw it in the bin and I'm going to go ahead, it's crap. So, this is the purpose, is to make you guys and girls make the right choices and keep away from lemons or faulty telescopes or crap telescopes. I don't want you to make the, a mistake. What all falls down to is the telescope helps people learn the skies and all that. But and again, this is actually impacting them a big larger scale and it puts people off and people will rather just look at uh, online, on the internet and look at images of great objects. Which is fine, that is your choice if you want to do that. But if you want these people actually think, well, do we actually see uh, an image or you know, a telescope and see for myself, then you need a good telescope and a good telescope within budget as well. Now also to this day and age people are spending online and they're going to online stores uh, on the internet and believe me you can find some good deals but again another thing go to a dedicated uh, astro uh, online shop. Now I'll give you a list of names of all the good uh, websites you can visit which I seriously recommend and I have shopped there before by experience where you can go and buy all this decent equipment. So there will be a list of at the end of this program of all the websites you can visit and buy quality telescopes. But one thing, one key area is to also to be aware of is avoid some of the websites. Now I'm not saying eBay is bad because there are a lot of good bargains out on eBay and you can get really good second hand telescopes out there for not much money but be careful when you go on eBay because that's where all the scammers are they're out there and they're wanting to make a quick buck in other words you can, uh, you can see a nice telescope there for god knows how much price and believe me there's a lot of trash uh, telescopes on eBay so again, I wouldn't advise you to shop online if you don't know about telescopes or what to look for. Go to a proper dedicated astro uh, telescope shop in your local area. Go there, believe me, by going and visiting the places that you see, go to the shops and have a look. In their showroom, they will have telescopes already set up. And you can go there and you can actually physically see what you're buying. You know, and the good thing is the people there who are selling these uh, telescopes will be able to advise on your applications, your uses. In other words, whatever, if you have a certain aspect or what type of telescope you're a bit concerned about or you're worried about collimation issues. And also, they will also work out within your budget. They will pick out a telescope within your budget that 
The, the people there out there are very helpful and they will help you make the right choices. You will have a much better chance making the right choice, getting the right telescope for you. I can't stress that enough. I visited loads of astro shops and every one of them are all good. There are really good astro telescope shops out there. I've never had a bad experience in visiting one of these astro and telescope shops. So please, top recommendation, go to a shop near you in your local area and visit the shop. Have a look for the telescopes yourself because believe me you can make an easy decision uh, on telescopes you, you see and you can buy and you will guaranteed that you'll get a good scope for your money and avoid the trash telescopes. So now we're going to take a close look on the so presentation. This is my presentation on how to buy a good telescope for Christmas and avoid a cheap nasty trash telescope. Five things to consider when choosing a telescope. The price, the aperture, the physical size, the type of telescope. And what do you want to use the telescope for? Now the fifth one I'm not going to highlight because the fifth one is basically a good question to ask if, especially if you're visiting a dedicated astronomy shop the retailer will ask you that question because the reasons for there's a lot of money implications a lot of different types of mounts and telescopes has to be uh, answered for in particular what on how you want to use a telescope now if you want to use it for visual the retailer will select a visual scope for you and again if you want to take pictures or astral images of planets or deep sky objects again the retailer will ask this this question because there are so many different types of telescopes and mounts it is a huge topic just to cover so I'm not going to highlight number five so the price how much do you want to spend I totally agree spending on astral gear is very expensive and again some people have a limited amount of money to spend on particularly Christmas is expensive I totally appreciate astral gear is not, not cheap again you can buy good equipment within a budget obviously through the presentation as I go through there are different types of budget levels to suit different types of telescopes. It just depends on how much you want to spend. You can spend on cheap telescopes for not much money. But if you buy cheap, you'll get cheap. In other words, you spend not less, you'll just get crap. Crap telescopes don't work. And to be honest with you, if you've got £50 or less is your budget, strongly recommend that you invest in a good pair of binoculars they're going to be the best telescope you can afford anyone on that, on that sort of budget and below do not spend a telescope for 50 pound or less because believe me you might as well throw your money away because the telescope is useless again biggest factor for beginners a lot of beginners don't know how expensive uh, astral equipment can be but also in this presentation as we go along there are different types of equipment to suit different people's uh, needs and requirements into astronomy okay secondly is aperture basically aperture is defined the size of the amateur of the mirror and the lens bigger sizes meaning as bigger diameters will collect more light gathering and basically with that light being collected you'll be able to see fainter and more detail on astral objects in other words the big the main function of a telescope is aperture is light gathering uh, beginners and newcomers make the mis 
mistake thinking that magnification is important on a telescope. Yes, I do agree. Magnification does apply to a telescope. However, the main function of a telescope is aperture. You want to collect as much light as possible. So, aperture is very important to capture as much light as possible. But have as you progress on bigger apertures doesn't mean it's going to be better for the user. Okay, it collects more light, but as you increase in sizes of aperture, it makes the telescope much more heavier. It makes it less portable to move around because of the weight. It means that if a telescope is, has to be a bigger aperture, it might have a longer vertical length. In no words, you need to balance the mount and the tripod, which means it could lead to longer setups. Also, due to the bigger size, means it could put people off from using the telescope because of the weight, because of the size, because of moving it around, transporting to a car, might put people off from using the telescope and might not even use the telescope at all. The telescope will not get used and you just collect dust. And again, people make the mistake thinking that big apertures uh, means uh, it's a good scope. Believe it or not, the ideal aperture size really depends on your uh, on your decision or your uses but I have found over the years there are certain apertures that I have used and I've used uh, from a small as a 60 millimeter refractor to a 12 inch uh, reflector now I had a 12 inch uh, reflector it was a Dobsonian and it was far too big and it was far too heavier I had used it but because it was a, a bit of a ball lake to move it into a remote area to set it up, I found it, it started to put me off. It was a more of a hard work trying to lug this massive telescope into the field to use it for astronomy. So obviously I got over the aperture fever and I actually sort of downsized to an 8 inch uh, reflector, which is a lot more manageable lot more easier to use, the setup's a lot quicker and again it's all boils down to the big size doesn't mean it's going to be better for some people. With bigger apertures it's going to take longer to cool down. What I mean about cool downs is because of the large diameter of the lens or mirror it takes a while to cool down and basically what's happened is if you can imagine me uh, taking my telescope outside my house and in outside my garden, what will happen is if I start using the telescope, I start putting the eyepiece, focus on an object like Jupiter, I look at the object, the actual planet, I notice something in the image already that the Jupiter is shimmering everywhere. I can't make out any of the details and all that. And basically what that's, what's happened there is I have warm air currents in my tube in my telescope that's trapped in there and basically the heat is trapped and basically all the heat is escaping from the telescope and with that that heat that's getting extracted out it's causing the air to be turbulent so basically what you're seeing is as I'm looking at Jupiter it looks like Jupiter is on water and you can see it just shimmers everywhere and what that does is, is you won't be able to see any detail on the planet. So basically the whole purpose of cool downs is to allow the telescope to cool down to the ambient temperature, temperature surrounding it. So in other words it could take probably 10, maybe even to an hour. So basically when you set up your telescope, get it set up outside, let it cool down before you use it. Then we go on to physical size. Here we have a big Dobsonian uh, Newtonian reflector on, on its mount. It is huge. Uh, big scope, 
awesome for aperture you can see a lot of things deep sky objects would just pop out with this thing it is unbelievable you also see unbelievable detail on planets as well but again it's bulky which means if it's bulky I might struggle again it into my uh, my car so if I'm taking it to a dark site getting this thing into my car could be difficult I had a 12 inch dob believe it or not that 12 inch dob weighed 60 kilograms it was heavy and again that put me off because it was too heavy I basically didn't use it I sold the telescope now I don't have it I've downsized again get a telescope that's manageable for you when you go to increase aperture it gets heavy and also being heavy takes longer setup depending usually dobs are usually quite quick to set up so they don't take long to set up your dob and and, and so forth but rather if I was going to mount a, a Newtonian of a 10 inch or 12 inch reflector on an equatorial mount for example I need to balance the scope I've got to collimate the optics I've got to do a lot of things to get the, the setup to work so having bigger things can lead to longer setups and again as I mentioned about the bulkiness transporting a big reflector can mean it can be difficult transporting it it's not great for taking a telescope of this size particularly if you're going on holiday if you're driving by if you've got a big enough car that's fine but to, if you're actually flying and, and you're going to places uh, a big scope like that is not really ideal for carrying about with and believe me 60 kilograms just the tube by itself is heavy so obviously a setup you see here is a small telescope a lot of beginners prefer to go for a portable approach uh, as you can see as it's more portable, it's compact, it's easier to store, yeah, it's light. The good thing about this setup, it's also quick to set up. So basically, some setups are so quick, you just literally extend the tripod legs, sit the telescope there, switch it on, or do whatever, and set the eyepieces in. It's that quick. Easy to use, quick to set up. And again, Using a smaller scope demands less storage space, so you can even fit these scopes in cases. Portable compact sizes means it can be transported anywhere and making it a good ideal package to take around for you on holidays for example. The main problem about a small scope is you have limiting aperture, so you're not going to get uh, decent uh, views compared to a big scope. You make the decisions on what type of telescope you want to go for and again there is a balance between big and small you you can set a, a set level so now i'm going to go on to type of telescope this is to help beginners uh, decide on what telescope they want to buy there are many advantages and disadvantages between each of the models there are four different types of telescopes you can buy so we're going to start off with refractors. This is basically just a lens element where it's just the light gets collected down the tube through the objective lens and gets focused by the eyepiece. Again, refractors bend the light, giving the resulting image. Very simple design. So the perks of a refractor. It provides the sharpest views of any other telescopes. Because the, at the objective lens, there is no central obstruction. In other words, you'll get a clear light cone going through the objective lens, down the tube, and gets focused. So you have razor sharp images. Again, portable in sizes between 60mm to 100mm apertures. The good thing about refractors is that there's no collimation required because refractors are held in by a lens cell, they're fixed into the tube 
and there was just no way of the lenses to go and get mis misaligned inside so they hold the collimation also refractors are easy to set up there's no need to do any other but just set up the mount the tripod uh, put the t uh, telescope on the mount and it's, that's it it's so easy they also have quicker cool downs refractors usually take around about 5 to 20 minutes to cool down so it's extremely fast because of the no central exruption on the lens system, they're great for planets and the moon. They're not bad for deep sky objects. Preferably, I recommend a 75mm or above. So a 3 inch refractor will show you a lot more things uh, compared to a 60mm telescope or below. Yes, those instruments do help but they're not great. A good 3 inch refractor will reveal a lot more better detail than the others and more, uh, more objects will also come to view with a particular instrument of that size. The bad points of a refractor is they are made in limited sizes because a lot of heavy machining involved even using CNC machines to grind down lenses to highly polish them to a minute's tolerances again you have to machine them at both sides it's complicated work it's expensive it's painstakingly difficult to machine them hence the reason why they go to certain sizes also when you go any bigger than a 6 inch they start to get really heavy they will start to sag into their own uh, tube that they supported. So again, lenses, when they get made into bigger sizes, can be very expensive. So up to 6 inches is usually the maximum you see for most amateur telescopes. Again, if the telescope is pointed up in zenith, or straight up at 90 degrees, you'll find that the focuser users will have to bend their neck to try and look up in the night sky to use the telescope angles at point where you're trying to use the telescope you can get sore neck the top tip is to use a mirror diagonal to prevent you from bending your neck it is advised that you get a refractor with a mirror diagonal there are three different types of refractor and again, the Acromats are the cheapest of the line, but they are good. They have, uh, I will explain later on, on the, uh, an Acromat. Extra dispersion glass refractors are basically the same as Acromats, but the, the lens elements are highly machined a lot more. They are tested in, in a certain way. And basically, they're tested to provide the the red and blue and green light waves to be focused to a single plane. So it's a much better glass, highly machined glass. But again, expect to pay moderate prices. I mean, four hundred to five hundred pounds for an ED glass refractor is what you expect to pay for. And then we go on to Apple Acromats. These are extremely expensive. They have a triple lens element, and again, they're highly tested, highly grinded down and polished uh, to provide all the light waves, the red, green, and blue, are all focused to a single plane. I expect to pay thousands of pounds for a particular refractor. And again, you must get an Acromat. An Acromat is the bare minimum for astronomy. If you get a single lens system, and a lot of cheap telescopes out there will have a lens system, but usually the cheaper ones will just be a single lens. Absolutely useless for astronomy. So this is my top tips in buying a refractor. Look for a 70mm aperture refractor. You can see a lot of 60mm and 50mm refractors. But from my personal experience of having owned those particular telescopes, 
personally they are useless for astronomy and they just they will show you things but not great you know you may be restricted looking at the moon and the planets and that is all and maybe some deep sky objects but a centimillimeter or bigger will show you a lot more detail and will show you more, more deep sky objects into view and again you start to see a lot more detail on the planets and the moon it's a lot better than a 60 or a 50 millimeter refractor again always look for an acromat refractor which is a double lens system minimum again as you're looking at a telescope that you're interested always look for a, a coated or fully coated or multi coated optics coated means that there's just one side of the objective lens that's coated with this uh, transmission, uh, high transmission coating. What that coating does will prevent stray light from ruining your images and help to uh, capture more light and get it all focused. The fully coated is based an objective lens that is coated on both sides of the lens system, a multi coated objective lens. Every side of the crown and flint glass is coated by this high transmission coating. If you get a, a, an instrument of that quality, you will get good views. In fact, it doesn't matter if you have coated or fully coated, you will still get decent views through the instrument. A lot of cheap telescopes do not have this particular coating and, and there will be horrible, horrible images so now I'm going to explain what chromatic aberration is. Chromatic aberration, or known as CA, is basically you have a single lens element and you can see the all the light waves, the white light, and basically what happened is that the single lens acts like a prism. So what it does is it bends the light and as it goes through it separates the blue, the green and the red primary light waves and what that does is as it bends it it splits the individual light waves so if you're looking through a single lens element and you're looking at the moon for example you will start to see the blue colours in the image you start to see a bit of green and the red and it's all scattered and what that does is it creates this false colouring effect and with this false colouring effect it will also make the image look really blurry a horrible uh, false colour you start to lose detail on there and again a lot of cheap telescopes are made from single lens elements shockingly enough some of these cheap telescopes are actually made from plastic so again if you're buying a telescope do not buy a single lens element so as you can see here as I recommend about the acromat doublet it's basically two uh, elements of glass you have a crown and flint glass the white light goes through it splits the light rays Again, as you can see, the red and the blue spectrum is focused still. And so, like, if you're looking at the moon, for example, all you will see is a much sharper image, but you may get a slight tinge of green. As you can see in this picture, that's what you'll see. You'll start to see a green tinge around the moon. It's just a slight halo. But don't let that put you off. It's still pretty good. It is still maintained um, in making the image much sharper. Just a hint of false colour. It's not bad, but it's, it's better than a single lens element. Now again, if I was going to get an extra dispersion glass, then your green light waves will be a lot more focused to the single plane. Not quite as much but it will be even better views and the false colour will be reduced even further. This is an example 
of a single lens element and as you can see blurry horrible image you can see this blue halo and then you see the red halo there and as you can see there not a focused image it is horrible this is what Galileo many many years ago when he first pointed his telescopes into the moon he would have had that similar effect and yeah here is Jupiter I use an Acromat refractor and this was just a 70 millimeter refractor you can see you can see good detail there and you see a slight blue halo around the disc it's not particularly bad but it's much more defined it's a sharper image you can see clearly see the uh, two main equatorial bands and again yeah, you've got a slight purple halo but don't let that start on you as I noticed for years longer photical lengths of a refractor tend to reduce uh, the false colour effect the longer the refractor uh, the, the better the uh, the light waves gets corrected. The short photical lens will increase the false colour effect. Again, it means that the, uh, the lens systems are grounded to a steeper angle curve. In other words, it will bend the light a lot more. But by doing that is with acromats, they can't get all the, the light green and, and blue and red light spectrums to be focused accurately obviously better glass will help to reduce the false color so but again you'll get brighter images through a short focus refractor but there are ways to reduce that effect in my other video guide on how to improve refractors an apple chromat this is Saturn using my TS 115mm Apple refractor as you can see here excellent color correction and as you can see here all the all the red the green and the blue light spectrums are focused to a single plane good color the images are really sharp and because it's a triple lens element the costs are extremely high and again I wouldn't advise or recommend a beginner to buy a a triplet apple refractor an 80 millimeter triplet will cost around 850 pounds it's a lot of money but you do get the best images through any telescope and an apple does provide that so we now move on to an, another instrument and we're going to cover Newtonian reflectors Newtonians are basically a mirror type telescope it uses mirrors to focus your images basically the light goes down the tube gets focused on a primary mirror and all the light waves gets bent back to a main, uh, to a secondary mirror called the flat mirror and then it gets sent to the side of the tube and gets focused by the eyepiece very simple design the perks of the reflector is it is the cheapest telescope for big aperture you get the best bang for your book. The reason why they are made cheaper is because you only require the main mirror to be highly polished, highly grounded down. The flat is just coated. So it's only one side it needs to be made, made accurately. And what that does is because there's less machining involved, a lot less equipment needed to make the, the mirrors, they end up being cheaper telescopes. Good thing about mirrors is they reflect light. They do not bend light uh, through a prism, what like like lenses do. And what you do get is you get natural white light getting focused into the telescope tube, and you get none of the false colour involved. Good thing about reflectors, because of the big size of the mirrors, they are great for deep sky objects. They capture the faint fuzzies there. They're okay for planets in the moon. Now, on the reflector, there is a central obstruction 
on, on that instrument and because the secondary mirror is in the way all the light gets focused back onto it so you do lose a bit of resolution on a reflector but don't let that dishearten you they're not the sharpest images but the light grasp is gained because of the, the huge amount of light that's collected through a reflector so you actually gain brighter but more detail on the planets and all that they can be uh, portable in certain sizes 65 millimeter to 150 millimeter aperture sizes now the bad points of a reflector unfortunately because of the size of mirrors they take longer to cool down because where the mirrors are designed they do suffer from coma as you go into fast f ratios of f5 and below the coma effect gets worse but i'll explain what coma is they also require collimation the adjustment on mirrors basically the mirrors from time to time if you're setting up your telescope outside to a remote dark site the mirrors that are secured by uh, bolts will probably work loose and they'll be misaligned that is completely normal, it's the way the telescope is designed. You will need to collimate the mirrors, get them adjusted, so that once they're adjusted, you'll get decent views. Also, with reflectors, they have delicate mirror coatings, and they require careful maintenance. They are so delicate, you do not want to drop anything down that tube because you will damage the coatings and it makes uh, it will then damage the telescope and it will seriously affect your views so again when you're cleaning the mirrors please refer to my video guide on cleaning a Newtonian time after time the do not worry about dust or dirt getting into the, the main mirror itself there's nothing you can do about it but if you get a dusty mirror leave it well alone because where the way it's designed uh, the focuser where it's mounted on the side has a problem with inward focus travel in other words if you're going to attach a camera onto there you might not be able to focus your image properly reflectors to a certain sizes if they're bigger sizes they tend to be heavy and bulky. So my top tips on uh, a Newtonian reflector. The minimum size for beginners, I prefer you to pick no less than a 140mm aperture. Anything smaller, personally, with my experiences, they're just useless for serious work. A 140mm aperture will give you decent views and loads of a wide range of deep sky objects will come into view anything less than that avoid always look for a parabolic mirror uh, these offer better quality images and reduce the coma effect to a minimum level so when you go to a shop or retailer ask them does it have a parabolic mirror strongly advise that you look for a reflector with a parabolic mirror it is highly recommended that you buy a Cheshire or laser collimator eyepiece if you're considering Newtonian when you set it up even straight out of the box I will guarantee you now that the mirrors will be misaligned so if you do use a telescope straight from the box the optics mirrors will be misaligned if you're buying a reflector buy a Cheshire eyepiece at least for about 20 to 30 pounds it is crucial that you get a collimator to invest on something to align the optics if you want the best possible views from this instrument you've got to adjust the mirrors for people on a limited budget around 160 to 300 pounds then the best bang for your money is a 140mm to 
to 200 millimeter aperture telescope as you go for a decent size go for a Dobsonian a Dobsonian is basically a Newtonian reflector that is mounted on a, a box style mount very simple design and basically you can just point and uh, and look through the telescope just by moving it by hand easily a dob telescope is a lot sturdy it's a very sturdy mount it's simple you'll find a lot of uh, telescopes you know reflectors mounted on very cheap equatorial mounts personally i wouldn't even look into something as cheap as a, a cheap equatorial mount Go for a Dobsonian telescope, they're very simple to use. The only disadvantage of a Dob telescope is that it's not going to find objects for you. It's not going to provide tracking for you. Basically, you need to use a star map or a star app to try and navigate yourself to the stars and, and basically find the objects for yourselves. So, I'm now going to describe the coma effect. Here we have an image taken from a DSLR, uh, basically for a 150mm f5 Newtonian. And as you can see, the effect on the stars are slightly oval. They may give out a donut uh, shapes or look like little comets like these. Basically, it is caused by the curvature of the main mirror the main primary mirror and basically that light gets bent across this mirror and as you look at the field of view of your eyepiece you see all the pinpoint stars in the middle but as you look around the field of view at the edge that's where the stars get distorted don't worry about this this is completely normal on these telescopes don't worry it's not faulty it's the way they are designed because the main mirror is grounded uh, in a concave uh, formation that's what gives that effect on the stars you can eliminate coma on a Newtonian but you just need to purchase an extra item called a coma corrector and basically you can find these in good telescope retailers for about 80 to 100 pounds and basically this is just a secondary uh, optical uh, lens design which will screw onto your eyepiece holder and basically it will get fixed into your focuser and you can put your eyepieces or your DSLR camera in there and what that does is it flattens the field of view and makes uh, all your stars appear pinpoint it's it's a good investment if you want to take good astral uh, pictures of deep sky objects through Newtonian it's a, it's a definite recommendation for coma correction. However, if you're just going to use it for visual use, then to be honest with you, live with coma. Get used to it. It's If it really bothers you, invest in a coma corrector. But personally, if you're going to use it for visual, then don't worry about it. Finally, we're going to move on to a different type of telescope. These are called compound telescopes. And these are telescopes that consist of mirrors and lenses combined together. There are two different designs. There's one that's called the Maxutov design and the other is the Schmidt design. Both telescopes are basically the same sort of designs. Basically here on the Maxutov you have a, a meniscus lens and basically this is a concave uh, objective lens where the light gets bent into the tube the light gets focused back onto a primary mirror at the back the light gets reflected back to the secondary mirror up to the meniscus lens this is just basically a an aluminium coating and then the light will then get reflected back down the tube again and gets focused at the eyepiece end the Schmidt is basically the same, but it has a corrective plate. It's just a flat piece of glass. Here the light gets focused back, bounces on the main mirror, gets reflected back to the secondary mirror, and then back down again 
to the eyepiece and that's how they work so we go through the Maxitoff perks they provide the sharpest views with color free images very similar performance reflected by mirrors you will not get any of false colors they are portable and compact at uh, 90 millimeter to 127 millimeter apertures there is no collimation required because it's a closed tube designed they're secured together tightly in there uh, providing you don't dro providing you don't drop it on the floor you basically for example my Maxitoff which is 127 millimeter is around about two meters foldable length so it's actually a two meter long telescope but because it's where it's designed well the mirrors and all that it puts it into a nice compact tube you know literally around 16 inches at the most and what that does is it gives you higher magnification so it's you know you can put decent eyepieces on there and you get more magnification from this type of telescope the bad problems with a Mac is because it's a closed tube design a lot of the trapped heat can't dissipate from the tube very well so in other words you know, I have a five inch, uh, I have a five inch Mac, and I have to give it a good hour for it to cool down. And because the light, because the heat can't escape down uh, through the tube, uh, it takes longer to cool down. Also, they're very heavy in large apertures. If you get one that's 150 millimeter to 250 millimeter because of the glass and the mirrors need to be grounded down more materials used they are extremely heavy also they make them more expensive where it's designed dew and moisture gets onto that meniscus lens very easily um, there's nothing you can do about it it's the way it is moisture will get in there the main problem about the Maxitov is they have longer foldable lengths and between F10 and F30 they're great for taking they're great for looking at planets because you can really boost up the magnification and see good detail but when you're using it for long exposure or taking deep sky objects they are extremely slow you need to take longer timed exposures to collect the light because the light travels very slowly through a Maxitov. And again, with the longer vertical lens, you will have a very narrow field of view for a Mac. And again, deep sky objects look very dim through an instrument of this size. So, my top tips in buying a Mac telescope. The minimum size I prefer is to go for 90mm. No, nothing smaller. 90mm is a good size, manageable size and compact. Again, look for coated, fully coated or multi-coated optics. It'd be a good idea to invest in a... It'd be a good... <clears throat> It be, it will be a good idea to invest in a dew shield. It is a must for this telescope, and if you don't want to spend a bit more money on a dew shield, then make a simple one by cutting up a piece of cardboard and wrap it around the tube and tape it to one side. You must have a dew shield because this collects moisture, gets trapped in there and you can end your observing session within not just hours within half an hour you must have a dew shield for this scope expect to pay around 150 to 600 pounds for a max with 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 all the experiences i've used with variety of instruments i find that the sky watcher 127 millimeter mac is a good all-round telescope 
it's still compact it's still portable it's still got plenty of uh, light gathering to for deep sky objects and it gives out good views on the planets that's why it's called a planet killer this instrument is outstanding for planets i don't know what it is with this design but every uh, every instrument that i've used somehow some strange reason that the mac delivers awesome views of planets absolutely outstanding so now we go on to the schmidt So now we go on to the Schmidt uh, Casa Green. They provide good views with colour free images because of the lens and mirror uh, design. They are portable and compact at 125mm to 150mm apertures. They are a good all rounder for planets, the moon and deep sky objects. They don't have long vertical length compared to a Maxitov. They have good mid-range vertical length, which gives you good all-round ability, not only for visual, but for taking astral photos, particularly for deep sky objects. Larger sizes are still compact in apertures of 200 to 250 millimeter, but they get heavy at that size. The Schmidt bad points, again, like the Mac, takes longer to cool down. Heavy in larger apertures, between 200mm to 400mm, they can be extremely expensive as well. Again, it's a Super Dew magnet, and collimation is required but not as regular compared to a Newtonian reflector. Again, you still got to adjust the, uh, the secondary mirror and the primary mirror, but they tend to hold, because it's a closed tube design, they tend to hold the collimation, providing you don't seriously knock it or upset the optic train, then you're fine. So they, they hold the collimation quite well. But because of the central mirror, the obstruction is, is larger on these scopes. So what that does is you're not going to get the sharpest views. From all the telescopes that I own, I've looked through a Schmidt. They are great images, don't get me wrong. But they're not as sharp compared to the other telescopes. But don't let that dishearten you. Schmidt's are good telescopes. They're not bad telescopes at all. But they do make up, like I said before, aperture. It makes up for aperture and you get more detail, more uh, of the bright ob more of the dim objects into view through a Schmidt cast screen. So my top tips in buying a Schmidt cast screen. You need to look for minimum size of 125 millimeter aperture anything smaller forget it 125 millimeter is a good size good aperture you're going to get good views from it and again look for coated fully coated or multicultural op optics 
And again, purchasing a dew shield is a must for this telescope. Castle grains tend to be a bit expensive. £630, about £2,000 plus for a Schmidt. It can be an expensive telescope. But again, uh, as the Celestron 5SC is a good all-rounder. It's perfect for a beginner. And I find that I've noticed with that particular design, it has a built-in wedge on the actual mount itself. So you can actually take long exposures for deep sky imaging. So it's actually really good uh, package, this Celestron 5 SE. So, what to look for on a good telescope. So, when you go into a shop and you see a telescope you want, go up to it, shake the mount and the tripod. And what you're checking is checking the security of the clamps, wiggle it about. You may get a bit of wobble, but what you're looking for is after you just move the telescope, do you get any wobble afterwards? And as you see, keep wobbling it, uh, check to see if there's no looseness at the tripod legs. If there is, try and uh, tighten up the, the bolts, wiggle it again, and again, you can see from this picture, very sturdy. It does have wobble when you put a bit of force to it. And I'm putting a lot of force onto that telescope. A lot more force. And you can see, it's dampening out, good damping properties. It's not moving about. And uh, yeah, that is a good mount. And that's what you're looking for, sturdiness. Because believe me, a good mount and a good tripod will mean... You're going to get good views of the of the deep sky objects and the planets and so forth. Now, as I mentioned before about coatings, as you can see in this picture, if you move the telescope and against the strong light, you want to see like a colour uh, on the coatings there, and you can see like a purple, green, or hay on there. That indicates some really good optics on there, and that's what you're looking for. Cheap telescopes do not have that coating, and really, without that coating, you're not going to get good views from it. So again, move the telescope, look into the strong light, see if it has this coating on the actual lenses itself. Also, you can find uh, the coating descriptions on the side of the tube. On here, it says coated optics. Also, another point out, uh, another thing to point out is some of the labels will tell you the dimensions. Here, the D indicates this telescope is a 102 millimeter aperture telescope, which is around about four inches, and the F indicates uh, 500 millimeters. Basically, that is the focal length of the telescope. Pay particular interest to those dimensions because you can actually calculate your eyepiece magnification through that telescope. In other words, if I was going to use uh, this telescope with a 10mm eyepiece, basically the equation to work out the magnification on this telescope will be 500mm divided by 10mm of the eyepiece. In other words, I will get... 50 times magnification from this telescope. So look at the specifications on the side of the tube. Also, not all specifications are labelled on side of the tube. They can also be around the objective lens or mirror. And as you can see here, there's a few dimensions here. And it tells you the, the diameter and the focal length and the focal ratio. It even describes what type of glass it is. This is an ED doublet, for example. Also, it says multi-coated optics. And as you can see here in this picture, a very good multi-coated uh, optics will have a deep purple or deep green U coating on, on the actual uh, lens itself. Really good optics there. But again, you will expect to pay... Uh, a bit more for that type of glass but again you will get good views from an instrument that is 
coated or multi-coated optics. So, look at the tripod as well. Wiggle the tripod itself. You're looking for a good aluminium construction. Very sturdy construction you're looking at. Uh, also check that your the wobble. Yeah, it will vibrate a little bit, but check see if there's anything afterwards, any movement. But again, you're looking really look at really good, strong aluminium construction tripods. Also check see if it has a steel tube. Steel tube might be heavy, but they're a lot more rigid, a lot more sturdier, better construction. They're stronger. And again, if you got a, if you look at the uh, a steel tube variety. Uh, would be a good recommendation for uh, a particular telescope. So look for a steel tube design as well. They're also very good. Also check for the focuser. Check see if it's a good plastic, ABS plastic, or preferred a metal focuser. Check the movement of the focus wheel. It should be nice and smooth. Extend it to the maximum. And what you're checking for is any free uh, any free play or movement between the, uh, the focuser tube itself. And again, it should be nice and smooth. You don't want any slippage in the mechanism itself. This is another style focuser. This is a Creston style focuser. You usually find them on good Newtonians. Check the mechanism again. The focus wheel should be nice and smooth. Also check, see if it has a, the 10 to 1 focuser, check the movement on there. Again, it should be nice and smooth, uh, no free playing at all on the actual drive itself. And also just check the clamping bolts. As you can see at the bottom of the base of the focus wheel, check the clamping bolts, tighten them up and try and move the focus wheel itself. It should not move at all. And basically what you're trying to look for is a good focuser that will hold in a bit of weight, especially when you're putting eyepieces or accessories or cameras on there. It's very crucial that you pick a good focuser for telescope. Now a good telescope will also have decent eyepieces. This is a, a good colossal eyepiece and it's a metal construction eyepiece in there. As you can see, good glass lenses. If you cut the eyepiece, you could you should see a good multi coat on there, which also gives you good views. Uh, as you can see down the tube, it has a darkened painted bottom of the eyepiece. That will also eliminate some of the stray light. Again, there's a cheap apostle, a 10 mil, and again, it's a good eyepiece. Uh, good design, good quality, glass eyepieces with multi coat. That's the sort of eyepiece you're looking at. Good eyepieces will give you good views. And again, even for the cheaper telescopes, there are still good eyepieces for cheaper telescopes. This one here is, is usually what you find on a lot of Sky Watcher telescopes, and you usually have. Uh, they are good eyepieces, they might have a plastic uh, body on them, but the lenses are good. In other words, they are glass lenses with a coating on there, and they are modified acromats, also indicators as ME. There's also a different uh, type as well. There's a Kellner, that's indicated K. That's a triple lens element. But again, cheap eyepieces long as if they have good glass, not plastic, and with good coatings in there. You should get good views uh, through your telescope. Believe me, bad eyepieces will affect a good telescope, and your images will be blurry and horrible. These are not bad eyepieces. They're not great for long-term use, but they're good when they're first starting out. But again, these are good eyepieces. Also, check the finder scopes. The, the aiming device is equally as important as the telescope. Now again, at the top of the top left here, you see a finder scope here. Again, look at the optical quality of the object lens. It should be a good multi coat. 
And again, good finders, you'll find them out there. But again, don't go anything smaller than a 6 by 30 millimeter finder scope. The main problem about finding scopes is if you're going to be a lot less aperture, uh, you're not going to see much out of uh, pointing the telescope. You won't be able to see the stars very well or the objects you want to view at. And a 6 by 30 millimeter is the bare minimum. Anything less, by all means, avoid uh, the, uh, the telescope. However, if you go to good astronomy shops out there and you ask the retailer, say like you've seen a telescope on there, but you don't like the actual finder scope fitted to the telescope, you can ask them to change it for you. It might cost you a little bit more, but around a 6 by 30 millimeter or much preferred a 9 by 50 millimeter finder scope is better. They can change it for you, not a problem. I'm sure there are good retailers that will be able to do that for you. But again, no, no smaller than a 6x30. The bad thing about finder scopes is they will give you an upside down image. This is completely normal in a finder scope. You can buy more expensive finder scopes with have a erecting prism which you can see in this picture here, this is a 90 degree uh, erecting prism. And basically what that does is it will provide me an upright image. Uh, one thing I have found out that I have finder scopes that had upside down images and I find it very frustrating to point the telescope and orientate myself on a particular target. And I, I have dif difficulties trying to find the object I'm on a view because of the upside down and back to front image. So again, if you want to look for uh, a decent finder scope, then go for an erecting uh, prism type. However, cheap alternative is you can't beat a good Telrad or a red dot finder. Now the red dot finder or Telrad is basically it's just a cheap plane of glass through the uh, through the actual uh, lens element here, and basically it projects. A target sign or red dot onto the glass and basically it provides a non modification but it gives you a wide field of view and the main part is it gives you an upright image so basically whatever object you're looking at it will be upright and they're very easy to use the red dot finder is okay but a tail rad finder is really accurate and uh, a lot of Dobsonian owners out there highly recommend the Telrad as a perfect choice, especially if you want to point the telescope at a, uh, a faint object. The Telrad offers really good uh, wide view, and you can, um, to be honest with you, a Telrad or Red Dot Finder, I think, is the better option for beginners because of the ease of use, the easy to handle. It makes pointing accuracy much better. The good thing about the Telrad and Red Dot Finder is that they don't lose the adjustment. So when you adjust it through the main uh, tube of the telescope itself, and you adjust it at the, the screws on the Telrad and the Red Dot Finder, you it tends to hold its collimation. So basically, it still holds its uh, accuracy. But with the finder scope at the top, you need to adjust the three set screws every time you set your telescope because I guarantee you uh, the finder scope would have moved about within its tube. So again, I like to run or red dot finders because they're easy to use and they tend to, you can basically just clip it on, off you go. So then, what to watch out for on a trash telescope? This is very important advice to help you guys and girls make the right choices because believe me there's a lot of cheap crap that's out there particularly Christmas time and you want to take this advice on board so you do not make the mistakes so far look at cheap wobbly tripods very thin design made out of plastic maybe metal but again look at it it's very flimsy and as you wobble it about, you don't want any free play and movement on a tripod. A useless tripod will not give 
the telescope any justice. You will not get decent views. Believe me, a wobbly tripod is no good for astronomy. Also, check the mount. Check the mount itself. As you can see here, I'm wobbling the actual tripod legs, and you can see, as soon as I stop moving it, it's wobbling about, it's dances, still movement in there. And again, it's no good for astronomy. You will get frustrated when you're trying to look at a telescope uh, and the, the, the images are moving about everywhere. You want a good sturdy mount, but this is no good. One thing I have noticed is there will be a good mount there, but you'll probably find that it's been uh, there's a there's a telescope that's been mounted on the mount. It's far too much weight for the mount. So again, avoid a telescope package where it'll have a basic mount on there, but a huge telescope fitted on there. it would be too much weight for that mount. And again, you don't want, don't fall in this category thinking, oh, I've got a big telescope. It might be a good telescope, but if the mount is poor, you are not going to get good views, believe me. So now we're going to move on to cheap eyepieces. Again, a lot of these companies that are bringing out these cheap telescopes will provide loads of accessories like eyepieces and mirror diagonals and Barlow lenses and you name it. A lot of customers fall for this trick. It's basically thinking they bought a decent buy because a telescope has loads of accessories. Please, by all means, avoid these at all costs. Telescopes with loads of accessories like these consist of very cheap eyepieces. As you can see with these Yugen eyepieces, which is a very old eyepiece design, which was like 300, 400 years old, they have horrible chromatic aberration. There are simply just cheap eyepieces. And as you can see in these pictures here, you can see that the actual lenses themselves are not actually made of glass. They are actually made of molded plastic. So, and again, they are not even coated. They're just clear plastic eyepieces. You're not going to enjoy astronomy with eyepieces of poor quality as such as these. Now, you'll probably find that there are good telescopes that you can buy, and you'll probably find that there's cheap eyepieces like these. If you've got cheap eyepieces, replace them, and get decent plus or eyepieces, or modify acromats, or Kellner eyepieces, at, at least. These serve no purpose for astronomy. They are so cheap and nasty, you're gonna have horrible views it puts a lot of beginners off uh, astronomy. Also, some of these eyepieces are very small. They are far too small. The minimum requirement for eyepieces is inch and a quarter. They're a good, decent size eyepiece. Anything smaller than 0.965 of an inch. They're just too small. You want to maximize the amount of light coming into your eye. And an inch and a quarter is a decent size eyepiece. There are good eyepieces. Also avoid bought cheap Barlow lenses. Again, they probably have too much magnification of three times, four times Barlow lenses. They are rubbish. They're just going to give you much more blurry images. Not even good enough for looking at the moon. Because they're just far too much magnification for the telescope and the aperture doesn't provide uh, enough light. Also, if you see a package that has a typical solo filter, like this one here, do yourself a favor, get rid of it. Do not use that filter. Do not even attempt to use that filter to look at the sun using your telescope. Destroy it, bin it, get rid of it immediately. Believe me, save your eyesight. These are cheap, darkened glass. They don't actually protect your eyes. And if that filter does fracture due to the amount of heat that's been focused down the telescope optical train, you're gonna burn the retina of your eyes. If you see a package like that, avoid 
it at all costs. If you want to invest on a decent solar filter, then please go to a dedicated astronomy a telescope retailer. They will advise you on a decent solar filter within budget at a good price. And the good thing is they, they filter 99% of the harmful rays from the sun and protect your eyes. So we now identified a cheap telescope. I'm now going to highlight the latest scams that's out there where those cheap uh, companies that are offering these cheap telescopes to try and trick customers thinking they've got a decent deal. So here we go. Just to test you out, after you've just seen uh, my presentation so far, please look into these images and decide for yourself which one would you pick as an ideal beginner scope. And yes, as you can see here in this picture, the left one is clearly is a cheapo telescope and the right one is perfect for beginners. The cheapest telescope as you identified is thin tripod legs, really flimsy. The mount is horrible, it's plastic, it's wobbly. As you can see, a tiny finder scope and tiny eyepieces of cheap made quality. The focuser is a plastic, horrible rack and pinion. And as you can see, it, you can see it, you can stand a mile up. You can see it's a trash telescope. If you look on the right, you see a good, sturdy aluminium body. You know, thick design, sturdy. It's got an accessory tray to help to stabilize the legs. The mount is decent. It's made of metal construction. It's even got slow motion controls. You can see by the tube itself, if you look at the focuser, it's a good metal focuser. And as you can see, the eyepieces and accessories are inch and a quarter format, good quality eyepieces. And the actual uh, aiming device itself is a good red dot finder, which is better than a cheap finder scope. So as you can see from that presentation, you have now identified what is good and what is bad. And as you can see, I would go for the right one because that is a good telescope. And this is the whole point, is to help you guys and girls to identify what's good and bad. So, we move on. Now, in this picture, this is a cheap telescope. But yes, it is a, a telescope that's designed for kids. It is a toy telescope. Personally, it's okay as a present for a, a child that's under five years old. But it's not great. You're not going to get decent views from it. It's only a toy. And to be honest with you, if you want to use it for astronomy, then if you've got a limited budget, say like £50 and below, this telescope doesn't cost £50. It costs around about £20. But personally, it's okay as a toy, but it's not great for astronomy. So if you are on a limited budget, then my top recommendation... If you've got £50 or less to spend, I strongly advise you to invest in a decent pair of binoculars. They will show you more than this package. And you can use it for other things. Alright? So, this is not ideal for astronomy. I'm sorry, but it's only a toy for kids. And again, if kids want a serious scope and they want to see decent views then personally, I would not give my child this, this telescope. I will get something better. So the next scam is avoid bogus claims that's indicated on the telescope uh, package. You'll probably see a nice package like this and boasting a, a telescope with a 50mm or 60mm of aperture. Avoid claims of this huge 60mm aperture with 400, 500, 600 times magnification. Believe me, these telescopes are not ideal for astronomy. And 
as I explain on this picture here, here's a picture of Saturn. Here you have Saturn with a, a refined image there. And as you can see in this picture, is this 150 times. Okay, you can see a lot of detail with that size picture. But as you boost up in magnification, the image starts to get blurry. It seems to be less sharp and less refined. And at 300 times, all right, reasonable uh, detail there. But then when you start boosting the magnification to 600 times, it becomes so blurry and dim that you can't even see any features. What is the point of boosting the magnification to 600 times? Most time, depending on uh, atmospheric uh, turbulence and conditions of the night sky, at the most, I've never used 300 times. I've actually used between 200 to 250 times on a normal night. It's very rare that you go beyond 300 times magnification, which is far too much magnification. You can see a lot more through lower magnifications. But when you have a, ref a reflector or a refractor or any other telescope that has a very small aperture, particular refractor of a 60 millimeter of aperture, at the most you can push out of that scope is 120 times. And there is a rule of thumb when considering inch per aperture is around 50 times magnification. So 120 times is pushing the limits of a 60 millimeter refractor and to be honest with you when you push that amount you're not going to see much out of it so ideally a low magnification of 80 to 100 times is the most for that telescope avoid telescope packages that show fancy boxes with nasa style pictures on there showing saturn and all its glory and the great orion nebula with all its colors and nebulosity these images are not going to do any justice you will not see vivid colors on nebulas you will not see nasa style uh, images of planets with superb detail particularly through a small aperture telescope you're just not simply going to see them good telescopes don't come in fancy boxes good telescopes do not show nice fancy pictures however there are good telescope manufacturers out there that are showing nice pictures of they are a bit more realistic because they basically highlight what can you see through the telescope and the images that they use is what you can achieve for the telescope they do not overemphasize a nasa style photo taken from hubble telescope they usually have images that's related to the telescope on what you can see. So they're all good manufacturers out there that do nice packages. The next scam is avoid a two for one package like this. Basically, uh, you have a telescope or a, an extra item like a microscope, for example. These packages are equally as bad as just buying it actual cheap telescope themselves in fact they probably made even worse quality than a cheap telescope that you usually see these do are these are practically just useless if you're gonna buy your loved one or kids this this package you might as well just throw this package in the bin avoid nice pretty pictures and nebulosity here as you can see it's all the estimated and you can see you got a, a microscope included this is just a scam to trick people thinking they bought a decent buy because it comes with two items believe me they're just practically useless do not waste your money on deals like this now the last part of the scam is there's a lot of companies now have done their homework basically this is a very good example. They've really gone into detail to trick customers. As you can see here in this picture, you can see it's a good box. It's not got fancy pictures. It's not boosting high magnification. As you can see here, it does 50 to 100 times aperture, which is good because it's within the limits of that telescope. But again, they've gone to town. They've done the homework. They're out there to trick people. The only thing you can identify 
straight away as you saw on the last examples again thin flimsy mount cheap eyepieces the focuser is, is horrible plastic focuser a useless finder scope and above all very small aperture and believe me straight away cheap nasty telescope again look at the signs straight away do you think that's more than adequate for astronomy and again it's got a pan and tilt uh, tripod which looks good but as you look at the bottom there's an a one quarter thread that holds that telescope believe me good telescopes are held in by vixen style dovetails this is just screwed on by one bolt can you seriously believe that that's going to be adequate for astronomy believe me that that telescope might be good but the mount and the tripod is so wobbly it you might as well place this telescope on a bowl of jelly but again i hope this presentation has helped you make the right decisions as you can see here i'm here to help you guys and girls make the right choices so that concludes my presentation i hope you have taken any valuable uh, information from that presentation please use that advice to help you make the right choices in picking a good telescope and avoid all these trash telescopes that's out now for Christmas. So again the good policy is you can buy good equipment for a decent price but don't buy things too cheap because if you buy things too cheap you will get cheap and you will be disappointed your loved ones or your kids will also be disappointed and if you have a bad telescope you are not going to enjoy astronomy neither are the kids if the optics are really bad you will lose interest you'll get frustrated with equipment and that is it and it will deter a lot of people from astronomy you will be put off from astronomy you won't be interested and you will not see then you're not going to go further in a field now if you buy a good telescope you'll get to see good views and you may even progress even further afield to astronomy so if you do like to uh, do astronomy you may want to take some excellent pictures and a setup like this what i've got outside of me will do that you'll get awesome images of deep sky objects in fact, both, both these starter scopes here, you see here, will give you good images of the moon and the planets. Okay, they're just basic mounts, but one key aspect is, they may be basic mounts, but they are sturdy mounts. You, and again, the, the mount is often overlooked, and you can have the best telescope in the world, but if the mount's not up to the job, then you're not going to see nothing so even though you have a decent telescope and a crappy mount then again a simple so something as simple as that will ruin your images these telescopes here what i have here are good telescopes and they will show you good detail on the planets and the moon and use it for deep sky objects you also see and again a lot of the good retailers out there will even let you look through and test the optics yourself and you can make the decision there and then. So there are good retailers out there that will help you make the right choice. Proper ed dedicated online astronomy shops, unfortunately you're not able to test the equipment but at least some of the equipment that they feature on online are good. Don't buy cheap because if you buy cheap you'll get crap. But hopefully that makes you make the right decision to buy for Christmas and to enjoy astronomy. The whole key aspect is for you to enjoy the equipment you're going to use and enjoy the views. And by all means, if you'd like to take on astronomy even more, then go ahead, go further afield. And believe me, I've been to astronomy for 28 years now. 
and I've made the same mistake. I've made, I've bought uh, trash telescopes. They're a waste of time. They're not going to do the purpose. Buy good scopes like these. Do yourself a favour. You, know, you will save money in the long run if you buy a decent telescope. And the good thing about these telescopes, they will last a lifetime. And you can get lifetime enjoyment from them. So they will, as long as you maintain them, look after them, and no matter when you don't want to need it, at least they will still perform as they should. Cheap telescopes don't, they just break and the views are absolutely appalling. Again, take this advice on board. Please shop safely. Go have a look for yourself and buy a decent present for Christmas, particularly for kids. They will appreciate it if you buy the right gear. So thanks for watching for uh, watching my video guy. Have a merry merry Christmas and a happy new year and look forward to a next uh, video guy coming up soon. So thanks again, thanks for watching and clear skies to you all.